Once again, good morning, everybody. Before we hear Dennis, we have a remembrance. So we're going to pay attention to uh, the folks who we have lost in recent times since we gathered here last.
producer, Sony Legacy, my friend Reinhard Schirr-Hennings, and Ed Polich. But there's someone here in the audience I want to have stick, call out and stand because much of the audio you will hear has been engineered by him, and it's very important that you get to know him if you haven't met him before. And his name is Carl Pearson. Yeah. and all-time radio experts in Chicago. So now with that, I'm going to do something Glenn Miller would advise us to do, which is to not talk too much and get right to the music. <laughs> so if I can get this thing started, welcome to Glenn Miller in 1942, and I think Glenn will start by welcoming you to this. Enjoy the program, and for the dancers up on the hill, grab your partners and start swinging. Boulder Buck.
Shipwreck Isle and all the Cincinnati students with a swell new tune, Sweet Eloise.
summer breeze, I smile on the wind, and though there may be. selects its favorite tune, and the tunes they pick are the tunes we play for them on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Now, if you folks listening have heard each camp's favorite, pick the one you like best, write it on a postcard, and send it to Chesterfield, Box 21, New York City. The camp or camps whose tune receives the greatest number of your votes wins Chesterfield Special Award, a beautiful radio phonograph combination. Fort Knox, Kentucky, headquarters of the U.S. Armed Forces, with special greetings from all of us to the boys down there in the station hospital. It's your night tonight, soldiers, and here's the tune you asked for, Deep in the Heart of Texas. Reminds me of the one I love. 
while musically, here's one of our latest recordings, Caribbean Clever.
exemplify. Tonight, the cab spotlight shines on Randolph Megan College in Lynchburg, Virginia, and Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But first, while everybody's lighting up those Chesterfields, the band starts serenading with the new tune dedicated to the boys that wrestle those famous little army cars around. We call it the Jeep Jackie Jump. <laughs>
Yes, um, but, but yes and no. I mean, in the book Moonlight Serenade, published in 1972, quite a few of them were documented. Many more of them are, are still documented that we have in our, our records. And we do plan at some point to put out a, a report that will show everywhere they went and when they were there, much like Ed did with Ed Polich did with the Air Force Band. Yes. Well, Johnny, yes, Johnny's very much with us. She couldn't come this year. And um, we speak all the time, obviously. She and I have to work together. Are there any grandchildren? Oh, yes, Johnny has several children. Yes. Know them very well. They're, they're here. They're right. Is there any chance that any of that material that you have, that you have, that played from that period that's never been released commercially, will be forthcoming? Yes. Soon? Richard, we'll yes. <laughs> I thought this would be a real teaser. <laughs> but yes, and, 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 what, and, and what's important about that, and we've been saying this for years, we've been trying to get around all the hurdles, is that a lot of this music, like you're, this is just a teaser. All, some of these are arrangements you know, but they're different because of the whole arrangement. Different. Like Sweet Eloise, that Bobby Hackett cornet solo is twice as long as it is on the record. The whole, it sounds different, you know. Yes, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of new tunes like Cheap Jockey Jump. I cannot tell you the millions, not just dozens, millions of times people have said to me, please, can we hear Cheap Jockey Jump by the civilian band? Well, there it is. <laughs> and it does sound a little bit different the way they play it. I was intrigued by the comments there about the military not knowing what they were going to do with him. I thought all that was prearranged by the general that signed the Welcome Award letter. No, the um, Army, well, two things happened. I think the Army had some idea of how they might want to use him. But they, they, first they sent him to Omaha to this region for special service, which would have made him a recreational officer doing volleyball games and things. Yeah. I don't think he had any interest in that. But they parked him there, then they sent him to Fort Meade. What the slides also showed was the Army Specialist Command, which they put him into to start, was not a popular uh, thing. They, it was a wartime expediency to get officers in that could run musical programs and recreational programs. Sports celebrities, musical celebrities were recruited into it. And it was an end run around regular Army procedures. Officer candidate school is 90 days. And these guys went for only 30 days because they wanted to get a lot of talented people in to do this morale and recreation work. But the regular army presented it, and Congress didn't like it because they thought it was a place where people who wanted to avoid the draft could park themselves. So it was eliminated at the time one was going into it. But what I tried to point out on the slides, and it, it's very important, when he went to March to do his first interviews, which nobody knew about until we dug into it and found his actual schedule, and the Army records, and they had had these meetings with him. He also met with the Army Air Forces. They had an absolutely focused view of what they wanted to do with him. <laughs> and in my opinion, I have it in the book, the AAF essentially said to, said to themselves, we'll just let him go into this 30-day Army course. It'll get around 90 days at Miami Beach in officer candidate school for the Air Force. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab him the minute he gets out of this, this thing. And they did. The AAF sent, it came from Hap Arnold, it went to General Somerville, head of the Army Service Forces, and the Army Service Forces had already ordered one back to Omaha. <laughs> so they're, he's waffling around, like where are we gonna put him? And they had places for him, they had the Bureau of Public Relations, which had what would become Armed Forces Radio, and they could have put him in that, but they did, they were, they were fumbling around, and the Air Force said, may we please have, well it didn't say it that way, but it says, essentially, may we please have one another, we like him, we want him, we know what we're going to do with him. And they said, okay, we'll send him to you, and the rest is history. He went into the A. And the, once the AAF did have a focused plan on what they wanted to do with him, you've heard in stories over the years, the Army Air Force has got him by a clerical error. That's absolutely untrue. They had a deliberate, they deliberately asked for him, and they got him. And then, then he went in, and there you go. No, was there something about the Navy and the pay-to-play thing? Yes, the Navy had the same problem with the Army, but only worse. 
You guys remember the name Tony Martin who ended up in the Glenn Miller AAF band? Well, Tony Martin was, was draft 1A at the time of Pearl Harbor. And he went to the Navy, as did some other people in Hollywood. And they um, got, there was an officer named, uh, I forget, Aroff, Nathan Aroff, I think was his name, he was commander. And he accepted bribes from a lot of people for commissions. You know, they literally paid for commissions to get out of the draft and to and get in the Navy and get cushy staff jobs. And um, Martin may or may not have done that. He was accused of offering air off his car, his Cadillac. And um, there was a, Martin was cleared, but Aeroff was convicted. But the Navy kicked Martin out. They, they, they brought him in as a, they said, well, we'll put you in as a chief petty officer, not an officer. And, they, they put, and then the trial happened, they kicked him out. He went back to the Army, and by that time, Glenn was recruiting people for the Air Force Band in 43, and he, he requisitioned Martin, and Martin's quote was, I thought I had I died and gone to heaven in the side door by being grabbed by Glenn. <laughs> <coughs> There's a tremendous amount of reissues, of fun reissues. Um, what, do you rec what do you recommend in terms of the most complete and best engineered uh, versions of the civilian and the military band? Well, sitting on the floor in front of you with somebody. <laughs> but no, seriously, I'm being facetious. Um, there are, there's a, there's a long list of good commercial programs that have, that have been put, commercial releases that are out there. Um, I don't have time to give you the whole list, but there are probably a dozen to two dozen things that I would recommend and others here who, who collect the, the, the music would recommend where you will get a cross section and 90% of the stuff that isn't repeated has been put out. I'd also selfishly recommend our what we now stream online and what we have had on, on terrestrial radio program I put on called Star Spangled Radio Hour, which we do bring out things from the vault and play them every week. On our, we stream them online from the, from the collections. And we do try to give a complete view. One last question. What was Roger Crawford's connection with the military band? Well, he, he two, two connections. It's going to be funny. You guys are going to have to tell a human story. Roger Crawford was actually recruited into the AAF band to be an actor on radio dramatic programs and an announcer and actor for Glenn Miller's Air Force Band when they got their radio gig on CBS and whatever, ISIS Day and Wings. But, Officially, his role with the Army Air Forces was a jujitsu instructor. <laughs> that was his actual job. And he was injured in a jujitsu demonstration, and he ended up having to take leave, and he was replaced by a gentleman named Lieutenant Don Briggs as the announcer. And then he eventually came back as an announcer. When the band went to England, he went with them as, radio, as one of the radio announcers and actors on their radio programs where they had dramatic sketches. But once they got to England, about, I don't know, about a week or two after they got to England, he was, Miller transferred him from the band to Armed Forces Radio. And then Crawford spent the rest of the war in, in England with Armed Forces Radio as an announcer. What idea, if it's any of our business, of the consideration that Chesterfield would have paid to the band, other than free cigarettes? I don't have the number off the top of my head, but there, this, that's a good question. Glenn, Glenn was under contract with Chesterfield. What you heard at the end, where Glenn had the last show on September 24th, his contract was up for renewal. He renewed his Chesterfield contract a month before he decided to go into the military. And that was for another season, which would have been the fall of 42 and the spring of 43. So he was on an annual contract, for, if you will, with Chesterfield, which was very lucrative. I can't give you the number off the top of my head. In today's dollars, it's prob was probably worth a million or so a year. But the men of the band, the musicians, because of union pay scale, earned extra money every single broadcast they were paid. And if you look at their, pay, their the payroll records, you will see what those guys are paid. And, and you know, a guy getting uh, $250 a week salary to get an extra $25 to $50 per radio show <laughs> or per recording session or per um, Fox recording section for the movie studios was a good deal for them. It was a lot of good money. 
Paul Tanner once told me, you know, all these stories about guys saying Lem was mean and bad and nobody liked him and they thought he was, you know, he was a cold fish and all this. Paul said, Dennis, anybody at any time was free to leave the band and go play for Benny or Tommy or anybody else. And guess what? We had the greatest stability in the business. Nobody ever left. We didn't have that many personnel changes. And he said, you don't want to, want to know the answer why we were happy? We were the highest paid band in the business. That's why. <laughs> last Chesterfield program, there's a, when Glenn says goodbye, we'll say goodbye in the best way we know how. There's a small smattering of applause, kind of, you know, then the band goes into Moonlight Serenade. And what he was pointing out was they hadn't closed a broadcast with Moonlight Serenade since 1940 because they would have been playing Slumber Song as their closing theme in 41 and 42. And then the band, then the audience erupts in a much louder applause. And what Richard was saying, which I think is absolutely true, is at that point, that's when it dawned on them, this is it. This is the last show, because he's playing Moonlight Serenade to say goodbye. Yeah. Yes? Um, Tex was in the Navy. What did he do in the Navy during the war, and why wasn't he in the Miller Band? That's a good question. Um, he, uh, some other people may know the, the answer as to why. I'm sure Glenn would have taken him in, but I think Tex wanted to stay in civilian life because Tex went with Horace Height after this. He was with the Glenn Miller Singers for a while in Horace Height, and then got his draft notice, and then he en enlisted in the Navy and enlisted. He became a chief petty officer, and he led a Navy band in Norman, Oklahoma. But I think it was all timing, and maybe Tex was thinking was going to roll the dice and see if he could stay as a civilian musician. For a, for a bit longer. You know, Glenn didn't offer everybody in his band the opportunity to come with him in the military because I don't think Glenn had the power or authority because of what he was going into and un, not knowing he was gonna have a band to offer anybody a job. Eventually, of course, four or five people did who were with him in civilian life did end, end up with him in the military. Ray Anthony had the best voted big band in all the war or just the south specific side um, or were there other were there a official best big band in the war ever uh, i know ray anthony got it for the south Pacific. that's up for argument among a lot of people because you're talking to the air force here and we're like no of course but you know <laughs> but i think that in the navy remember ray was in hawaii and not necessarily Artie. I think a lot of people would say somebody named Artie Shaw in the South Pacific probably was the premier Navy band. Or, or would you like to discuss this? <laughs> I'm speaking to somebody who's a big Artie Shaw. I think Marvin is hustling us off the stage because we have Reinhardt and Lauren coming next. So we're going to take a break and get reset. Okay, one question. Uh, is, there, is there any evidence that, or was there any press? Uh, comparing Glenn Miller to James E. Stewart? Not that I know, and it's too bad because I, it's, a, it, it's a very. James Reese Europe was the famous band leader from World War I, African American band leader from World War I, and, and basically had the role that Glenn had in World War II of being identified with the war effort, big time. And no, I don't think so. And I think, I think that's a very valid question and comparison. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> 